The idea of tracing the Abrahamic promise through the scriptures is a wonderful exercise. Of course, Bible students have believed for a long time that the promise made to Abraham in Genesis is the foundational promise that will bless the world in God's kingdom. Now, it's stated a number of times, Brother David uh, went over a few of those for us very well, uh, and each one is in one form or another, but the most meaningful one is the one that Brother David was looking at in Genesis 22. And what's important about this chapter is that the promise is made in its complete form here after Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice to God. So when the promise is, is stated, it begins this way. God said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because the house thou hast obeyed my voice. You know, in the past, uh, we talk about this being an unconditional promise. And that's confused me before. But I think I know what that means when we say that. From God's perspective, it was unconditional. This is a foundation of his plan. He planned to do this from before the foundation of the earth. But for Abraham, it was conditional that he would be used as one of the avenues to this promise. Notice all the times it says, because you've done this thing. I will bless thee. I will multiply thy seed. Uh, your seed will possess the gate of the enemy. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth be blessed. For him, it was conditional on faith. And so I think one thing we're seeing here, here is that faith is an important element of this promise. The promise is going to happen. But for those who exercise faith, either in this age or the coming age, that will be an important element to be granted eternal life under the terms of this promise. The promise was given to Abraham because he believed in God and he had the faith to offer Isaac. You remember in Hebrews 11, Paul tells us that Abraham's was, his faith was so strong that he believed that God could raise him from the dead. Now, God had never promised to do that to Abraham at that point, but his faith was so strong that he reasoned that's the only way for my son to have a family and the seed to be passed on. Paul also said that along with other men and women of faith, they received the promises of God, but they saw their fulfillment in the far future. But in spite of that knowledge that this was going to take a long time to be fulfilled, Paul says that they embraced the promise and they confessed them. Those are the ways you show that you have faith in God's promise when you embrace them and you tell them to others. Among those who saw the fulfillment of God's promises afar off in the distance was the prophet Daniel. And it's through the prophecies God gave through this amazing man of faith that we today can more closely pinpoint the general time frame when the Abrahamic promise will be fulfilled and God's earthly kingdom established. So looking at the book of Daniel from the perspective of the Abrahamic promise gives the prophecies there real meaning and real purpose, and they're all connected. You remember when Daniel was taken captive to Babylon, he found himself trying to live as Jewish faith in a very Gentile world. And of course, this created many challenges for him and his three Jewish friends. And because of this experience, seeing the contrast between what he had and where he was now, he had a deep desire for the reestablishment of Israel. He knew their captivity was God's punishment for the nation's idolatry and their many other sins. But he also knew there was a time limit, and he wanted to know when Israel would be restored. Of course, the reason for us God's answers are important. It's because the full restoration of Israel is prophetically connected to the establishment of God's kingdom. Israel, as has been said a number of times, 
will be the key instrument in bringing blessings to the world in God's kingdom. In fact, Daniel himself will be one of the honored individuals who will be God's earthly representatives. And think about that, the contrast between that future leadership and what we see in the world today. What a blessing to think that the future world leadership will be guided by God and will be made by individuals with integrity and loyalty to God and those who love the principles of God. They will be the men and women of God who won't be working for individual interest groups like we see today, but their heart and intent will be for the uplift and blessing of humanity. Just that thought is thrilling to me. The first connection to the Abrahamic promise in the book of Daniel, you know, is, is a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar was given by God. And I thought that giving this dream to a Gentile king was significant because it revealed that the Gentile nations would have a big part in Israel's future. The dream is given in Daniel, the second chapter. I'm sure you remember the story. When the king woke up one day, he was troubled by this dream, but he couldn't remember the details. And so he calls in his astrologers and his uh, sorcerers, and he demands to know not only the meaning of the dream, but what the dream actually was. And in answer to that, they said, well, if you just tell us the dream, we will tell you what it means. Of course, they could come up with any interpretation, but the dream was gone from his memory, as dreams often are. And in their continued defense, they said, no man on earth could possibly know what you dreamed. And this made Nebuchadnezzar so angry that he decreed that all men, all wise men of the empire were useless and they should be executed. <laughs> Although not with them at this time, this included Daniel. And when Daniel heard about this, he went to the king and he said that there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he will make it known to you. Well, Daniel was given time to consult with God. And when he came back before Nebuchadnezzar, he said something interesting. He said that the dream shall be in the latter days and what shall come to pass. Well, that clearly indicates that the prophetic nature of this dream was significant and in one sense was even bigger than Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel. It put the complete fulfillment of the dream far into the future, into the latter days, he says. And Daniel talks about the latter days later in the book. Well, as Daniel revealed the dream, he told Nebuchadnezzar that he had seen a great image of extraordinary splendor. It had a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of copper and legs of iron, and the feet were iron mixed with clay. He then said that a stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, and he struck the image at the feet, causing it to crumble. The pieces then became as chaff on the summer threshing floor and were carried away by the wind. And then it says the stone finally grew into a mountain to fill the whole earth. So clearly, this was far beyond Nebuchadnezzar. As Daniel explained the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the connection to God's promise. I think becomes evident. He said that Nebuchadnezzar's empire was the head of gold, that God had given him a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And then following Babylon, another kingdom would rise up. Cyrus, king of Medo-Persia, conquered Babylon. This kingdom is depicted by the breast and two arms. It was a larger empire, but one in a sense that was inferior to Babylon. In time, the moral leadership of Medo-Persia became degraded and even more so, more cruel towards Jews under some of its princes. And this inferior feature of Medo-Persia is depicted in the fact that the breast and arms are made of silver, which is inferior to gold. The belly and thighs of copper we know correspond to Greece, the third world empire under Alexander the Great. The vastness of the Grecian world was predicted in the statement that his kingdom would rule over all the earth. The legs of iron meant that the fourth empire would be powerful and divided into two parts, powerful like steel. 
God said that it would subdue all things, breaking in pieces all previous kingdom. Clearly, this was Rome, the mightiest empire to ever rule. It was so vast, in fact, that Emperor Diocletian decided to divide it into the Eastern and Western empires depicted by the two legs. The feet and toes of iron mixed with clay illustrate how Rome descended into a church state system when papacy got involved and it became to be known as the Holy Roman Empire. It finally split into multiple divisions, eventually comprising the nations of Europe. But what's important in connection with the Abrahamic promise is that the feet became the point in history when the stone would strike and the image would collapse, setting the stage for the most significant event in human history. That event is described in this chapter in Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is one of the places where Daniel's prophecy becomes prophecies of hope. This prophetic testimony said that there would be a long intervening period which would precede the fulfillment of God's promise to bless all the families of the earth. And of course, history confirms the accuracy of this prophetic dream. This prophecy reveals that we are nearing in time when God's kingdom will consume the kingdoms of this world and establish a reign of righteousness over the earth. That is depicted in that stone striking at the feet and growing to fill the whole earth. You know, as we watch the world around us falling apart, this is one thing that we can take courage from that the breaking down of man's institutions and governments following that will be something wonderful and grand. You know that history has made it plain that when fallen, selfish, imperfect men rule this world, oppression and cruelty usually follow. The memory of what is transpiring in human history is going to be an eternal reminder of the countless scenes of man's inhumanity to man. The world will one day come to appreciate that no government under fallen man can provide the protection, the justice, and the blessings inherent only from God as his kingdom grows to fill the earth. This reality is highlighted in the next prophecy we'll look at. In the fourth chapter of Daniel, we read that the same Nebuchadnezzar was walking in his palace and he was marveling at the power and majesty of his kingdom. And in his pride, he said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? And even as the words dropped from the proud king's lips, a voice from heaven came. And it said, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Well, unlike the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, when he was seen as the head of gold, this divine pronouncement addressed the pride, the human pride that was in his heart. Nebuchadnezzar was to be punished for that pride. He was made to live in the fields like a wild animal for, we conjecture, seven years or seven times, as it says there. And so he did. Can you imagine what everyone in Babylon thought of this once mighty, majestic, proud king eating grass like a cow. Now, most likely this will never happen to any of us, but I'll tell you, it illustrates the danger of what's plagued humanity and what pride can do to someone's heart. And it tells us what God thinks of human pride. But besides the personal humbling of this mighty king, God was also giving us a prophetic time marker indicating the length of Gentile dominion first over Israel 
and then pointing to the time when the transition would begin from the kingdom of men to the kingdom of God. This is how Bible students understand this chronological time marker. A biblical time is one year of 360 days. And so clearly seven times then is equal to 2,520 days. Using the scriptural method that one day represents one year, we see that this is actually describing a period of 2,520 years. Now, since this is connected to the time Gentile powers would dominate the land of Israel, we begin the timeline in 606 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar first invaded the promised land. 2,520 years later then takes us to the fall of 1914, when Gentile dominion over the land of Israel was prophesied to end. And what makes this truly convincing is that we see historical evidence for the fulfillment of it. And it's telling us one thing that's really important. It tells us that prophecy often leads to the beginning of a process and not necessarily to its conclusion. Well, you know that 1914, as it was said, saw the beginning of World War I. It's a very terrible, destructive war. But besides the destruction, one feature that ties this prophecy is that World War I began the process of removing Gentile rule over the land of Israel. When the British government declared war on the Ottoman Empire, who at that time controlled Palestine, the British began immediately to consider the future of Palestine once they had control of it. A committee was formed to determine what their policy would be regarding the partition of Palestine. And as has been stated, finally in 1917, the Balfour Declaration was issued. It was a public statement by the British government sent to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the British Jewish community, announcing support for the establishment of Israel as a homeland for Jews. And read just a little part of it. It says, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Extraordinarily significant. This small beginning led to the eventual establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. Gentile control of the promised land ended when Israel formed its own sovereign government for the first time in over 2,500 years. This wonderful prophecy then gives us the general time frame for the establishment of God's earthly kingdom. 1914 began the process of removing the powers that control this world. I think many of us will admit it's taken longer than most Bible students expected. But since this is what God planned and we see it unfolding before our eyes, we know because it's from God, this is the best way. And of course, it has been a painful process. Scriptures liken this transition time to the labor pains that a woman experiences when giving birth. Now, obviously, I don't know what that physically feels like, but I know that giving birth is very painful. Between contractions, there's a time of rest until another even stronger contraction comes. And I thought, what a perfect illustration of what we've seen in history. The two world wars were like these tremendous birth pangs, followed by short seasons of rest. World War I accounted for an estimated 15 to 24 million deaths. World War II saw between 70 and 85 million deaths. And I was a little surprised at how wide those estimates were. But I think that just shows you the chaotic trouble that filled Europe during the war. Even the statistics were hard to come by. And obviously, there have been many more conflicts and wars since that time. I even tried to look up how many wars have existed since World War II, and it, the list was almost endless, far too many to show here. Well, we still see the world in turmoil today, don't we? And of course, there's more to come.
because the kingdoms of this world have not yet become fully those of our Lord. But the encouraging part of these prophecies is that this trouble will not continue forever. All of this will lead to the birth of God's kingdom, to that stone growing and striking and growing to fill the earth in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. You know, I, I don't know this again for a fact, but I've been told by women uh, that they hardly remember the, chain, the, the pain of childbirth when they're holding their new baby. Yes, the memory is there, but what was born is so precious that it was worth the pain and mankind's gonna experience that as well. There are of course more significant prophecies in Daniel. There's so many, I think Brother Jim touched on a couple of them, but the last one we'll briefly examine relates directly to the Abrahamic promise. And it's found in Daniel, the ninth chapter. A fact is that the Abrahamic promise could never be fulfilled without an atonement for sin being first provided. The apostle Paul said, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And I will add that without the remission of sins, there could be no Abrahamic promise. Daniel was privileged to give us the prophecy of the 70 weeks leading to the great Messiah when the offering for sin would be given. The prophecy says in part, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The fulfillment of this prophecy at the first advent of Christ forms the legal basis for the Abrahamic promise to be carried out, and man's reconciliation with God to be accomplished. When it says the 70 weeks are determined to finish the transgression, oops, I'm on the head here. Yes. The Hebrew word translated transgression also means rebellion. Our race rebelled against God when Father Adam chose to disobey the simple command not to eat of one tree. But the sacrifice of Christ is going to end the rebellion of man by providing atonement and coming restitution. The tree Adam and Eve ate from was appropriately named the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Once they ate that fruit, the education of our race began. Now that the atoning sacrifice has been given through the death of Christ, mankind is guaranteed a resurrection. This sets the stage for blessing all the families of the earth as stated in this prophecy, his work will be to bring in everlasting righteousness. The angel told Daniel the 70 weeks would begin counting from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Using the same day for a year principle, we see that 70 weeks consists of 490 days or 490 prophetic years. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem after its destruction by Babylon was made by the Persian king Artaxerxes in 454 BC. 490 years from that point takes us to AD 36. Now, one interesting and important feature of this prophecy is that we're told in the midst of the week, talking about the last week, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. While this pinpoints the exact year of Jesus' death in the spring of AD 33, when his sacrifice ended halfway between AD 29 and AD 36. The connection to the Abrahamic promise then is that without the payment of a ransom by the death of Jesus, God's promised blessings would simply be impossible. As we study these things, we learn that Biblical prophecy is truly hope inspiring because it comes from the mind of God and because the plan is so good and it reveals the heart and intent of God to be a blessing to his creation. And we learn that God's blessings will bring blessing and life to this corrupt and dying world. You know, as a wise creator, 
God has allowed us to experience what life is like without him, without his guidance and his direction. And that is what we're learning. When the resurrection takes place, mankind will, after some time, be much wiser than Adam was when he was first confronted with the temptation to sin. As we live with the consequences of sin, we are learning that we cannot do this alone. We cannot live moral and righteous lives. We cannot find happiness. We cannot be prosperous and live forever without the guidance and blessing of God. I'd like to close by reading one of the most inspiring passages to me from Ephesians, the first chapter. This is from the Weymouth translation. It says, so abundant was God's grace, the grace which he, the possessor of all wisdom and understanding, lavished upon us when he made known to us the secret of his will. And this is in harmony with God's merciful purpose for the government of the world when the times are ripe for it. The purpose which he has cherished in his own mind of restoring the whole creation to find its one head in Christ. Yea, things in heaven and things on earth to find their one head in him. That one point there, when the times are ripe for it. Daniel's prophecies are showing us that the time is almost ripe. We are seeing the evidence, the beginning of the process of converting from man's kingdom to God, Christ's kingdom. Now, people sometimes ask, is, if there is a God, why doesn't he do something? And they don't understand that he is doing something. He is educating our race in a way that will someday help us make wise choices. He is planting an understanding of sin in every human heart that will remind us what, was like, what life was like when we as a human family rebelled and turned our backs on God. Each individual will someday be equipped to make wise choices of never sinning again. The difficulty of planting that in the human heart is why God's plan will take 7,000 years to bring mankind to perfection, to the full standing up before God. And that's what we have to look forward to. And our hearts are deeply appreciative that there are men and women like Daniel who had the faith for God to use them to share these wonderful prophecies with us.